This is the Build with Tech podcast, where we dive into the minds of business leaders, building tech-enabled businesses to launch and scale profitable enterprises. With your host, Ray Ortega. Welcome to the Build with Tech podcast, where we explore how technology drives business success. Our guest co-founded Palisade Compliance, growing it into the leading advisor on Oracle software asset management with over 700 clients, including Amazon and Google. He recently exited Palisade to support startups and mentors at University of Central Florida's Business Incubator. His career spans the U.S. Air Force, Dell and Oracle, where he managed operations across 62 countries. With a blend of entrepreneurship and public sector experience, he brings invaluable insights on leveraging technology for business growth. And his name is Stephen Sopko. Did I say it right? You nailed it. Great to talk awesome. to you, Ray. So welcome, Stephen. Thanks th- Thanks for joining the podcast. I you know, look forward to this conversation. We had a little bit of time uh, to talk recently, and uh, that's kind of what led to this podcast. And, and in that conversation, I mean, you had such great stories to tell and everything. I felt like this, we needed to do this. So, this so is thanks for be being fun. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. So first of all, let's get the audience to understand who you are and your background. I know I gave a brief description, but let's go ahead and tell us what do you do today? And then, you know, how did you get to that point? Sure. So what I do today kind of emerged from both running my own startup for 10 years that I just exited. And one of the reasons I decided to exit it was I was having a lot of fun and a lot of success working with other startups. So kind of helping them through the same, some of the same problems that I'd faced and honestly getting to work across a bunch of different industries instead of just really laser focusing on mine. So my background kind of gives me a little bit of knowledge across a whole bunch of disciplines, technology, sales, leadership, you know, all of the different things that a business needs. So I'm kind of a chameleon. I fit into where people you know, have the biggest problems, that's where I do most of my work. When did you officially start? Like, what was like, if do you remember back when you first started? I do. Let's see. I started uh, stage two in my new company, February 1st this year. And then I started Palisade, gosh, in 2013. So. Wow. Yeah, it's a good time ago. So, and your history before that, what were you doing before that? Goodness. So so going backwards. So before I started Palisade, I was at Oracle. So I was the Oracle vice president responsible for Europe, Middle East, Africa, sales negotiations, business practices, all that sort of stuff. Before Oracle, I, I had started up a number of businesses, mostly in offshoring, outsourcing, sort of more services, technology driven services. Before that, it was Dell. So I was at Dell for a number of years where I led negotiations for Dell public sector, you know, working with government, education, healthcare, all that sort of thing. And so going all the way back, I started my career in the uh, U.S. Air Force, where I was a contracting officer responsible for wearing two hats, one responsible for the computer systems across Europe, but also the negotiator for research contracts in Europe and the former Soviet Union. That is a very eclectic background, especially uh, one of the things that we talked about was Dell, because we realized that I worked at Dell at Nashville facility at the same time you were at the Round Rock facility. So yeah. doing what you were doing there. And and I was working, but I was working in a warehouse. I was throwing boxes. So it was a little well, bit I different. worked at, see, at Dell, when I first started, they had this program where the leadership could go into the warehouse during the holidays and pack boxes to go out, that sort of thing. But they stopped the program because they found that all us directors and VPs were terrible at working yeah. in the warehouse. We actually became more of a problem than a solution. So uh, I got to do that for the first couple of quarters I was there, and then we weren't really allowed to do it anymore. So. Yeah, I became a problem because I because of my ADD, they had me on the belt where like you had to turn around and pick parts and there was like mm. these little lights on this rack. I just couldn't keep up with the lights. Right. So they moved me to where I was just loading boxes on the conveyor belt because <laughs> they were like, this guy's this guy just doesn't have the brain for the lights. <laughs> we'll just we'll just take the box, let him put boxes on a conveyor belt. So, oh. so so tell me about what made you go into business for yourself? What made you what made you go independent? Oh, goodness. So. Really, ever since high school, I've always had a side hustle. And so, you know, I always had a day job that paid the bills. And I always had something that I did off to the side that, that really, when my, my day job was boring, the side hustle would get me through. When the side hustle was struggling, I just was happy that I had a paycheck from the day job. So really, I've been independent since my first business when I was 16 years old. And so the, the big thing, and it's funny, years and years ago, there was a speaker who used to talk about some of the best people he ever knew didn't realize 
what their job title was. So they kind of treated every minute, this is Tom Peters, they treated every minute at a job as if they were just a consultant there. And so one of my one of my people at Dell uh, one time, he was really angry at me about something. And he said, you know what? When you didn't really care if you got fired or not, you were the best boss. You know, when, when you just you, know, when you really wanted to do what was right and what was right for the customer and all that sort of thing. So for me, it's always been kind of as I rose up in these organizations, I would kind of go for a few years at a big company. And then I kind of the pendulum would swing and I'd go either start something or I'd be employee number seven somewhere or that sort of thing. And then that would either be successful or otherwise. And then I'd go back into a big company. And that pendulum's been going back and forth for a long time. And it just seems to work for me. Was there someone in your in your family that was an entrepreneur before or where did you get the like, how'd you get inspired, though? Because at 16, because I, I, I grew up in an entrepreneurship family, like my pa- my father owned a business, my uncles owned businesses, everybody owned businesses. So I kind of was drawn into it as a kid. But in your sake, how were you drawn in uh, at 16 just to start your own thing? Well, it's funny because I grew up right in the shadow of Kennedy Space Center. So everybody around me worked for NASA or Boeing or you know Grumman or all these giant contractors. So everybody in the town where I grew up was really what contract are you on and what giant you know, sort of aerospace or defense company are you working for? So really not a lot of entrepreneurship in that, that environment. There were two things I think that really did it. One was my mom and, you know, no 16 year old boy is ever going to give his mom credit for anything. But (laughs) but my mom really had the entrepreneurship bug and she would research businesses and try to figure out if she wanted to to do them and that sort of thing. So I constantly watched her going through that process. And I think the other thing that really did it for me was science fair. When I was in high school, my my science fair projects were all around keeping birds away from runways because, you know, a lot of airplane crashes are caused by birds. And so I was fascinated by ornithology. And the thing that I really learned from Science Fair was not only the technology side, you know, broadcasting sound waves and inverse square law and all that sort of thing, but then you'd package it all up. And frankly, you would hustle it as if it was sort of a junior version of Shark Tank in the mall, you know, once a year where you're standing there with your, your backboard and kind of talking about your project. And I think that really opened the door for me in my head to sales and, and kind of presenting what I was doing in the best possible light. And once that bug bites, you, you never lose it. So, yeah. Now, I do got to say your communication skills are off the charts. Like it's you, you speak very clearly and very eloquently. Like, where did that come from? Wow. Thank you. Well, uh, I was in radio for a little while until I found out what radio DJs make and kind of realized I wasn't going to be able to to have a life based on that. But but no, this has just been something, again, in school, both in, in high school, college and then in the military. I was always the one who got kind of selected to do the presentations. So okay. and when you are a very low ranked person in the military, you know, it's really sink or swim. And so, so you, you either get very good at it or no one ever sees you again. So. Yeah, that makes you. sense. And what would you say is some of the biggest challenges that you faced going along? I think the biggest thing for me, particularly in tech, is I kept coming up with solutions to a problem nobody knew they had. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, and I think that's the biggest single challenge for me. And I've done it over and over again where I have this bright idea and I think I have solved a problem that people should care about. And so I'd sort of lunge ahead into creating the solution or building the company or doing the thing. And then I would run into what I call the three-part problem, which is when you're trying to sell that thing that you've created, you have to convince people first that there's a problem. They don't know there's a problem, so you have to convince people of that. Then the second thing you have to do is convince them that there is a solution to the problem that you just taught them about. And then you have to third, convince them that you're, per- you're the person, your company, can deliver the solution to the problem you just told them about. And I think trying to sell three things in a short sales cycle, that for me has always been the biggest challenge. I can do just about anything else, but I think the thing it's taught me is to really do a lot more you know, testing and, and interviews and research to see, do people acknowledge this is a problem? And so I think that's that's been my biggest challenge. That's interesting, because I don't know if you follow Sabri uh, Subi, he's on YouTube. He's a huge, he's, I don't know if he's an influencer or whatever, but he's got a huge following and he, uh, he has, he had a video the other day that I was watching and it kind of goes along those lines where he talks about you're either somebody has a bleeding problem if someone's bleeding and you got, and you have the solution to solve the bleeding. Uh, but then he says the other solution is, is he calls it the arguing solution is you got to argue with people to convince them that there's, that there's a problem there. 
And so he yeah. makes that distinction when you're going out and you're trying to sell a product or service to, to find the bleeding problem, not the, the one that you're going to have to argue with people about to let them know the problem exists. Well, and I think it, it gets exacerbated by the fact that sometimes, even if you were selling your product for free, even if you were willing to give it away, zero dollars is too much for them to invest in your solution because there's a knock-on effect to everything they've already got going on, the availability they have of resources inside their company to deploy the thing that you've you've given them for free. So yeah. there have been so many times, uh, and you know, we would run into this at Palisade where we are going to do this service for them, but even if our price was one dollar, it was too much because people would have to care about where their software was in the company, and suddenly, yeah. you know, that had a huge impact on people's decision whether or not to work with us. And so I think that's the 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 knock on effect is even if it's a bleeding problem, then it's a question of where does it rank on all the other bleeding problems that the you know executives mm -hmm. are trying to to to, to solve. Yeah, because one of the biggest things is time, right? Time and energy. Like people don't want to expense energy in their own time. So to them, that's still a cost, even if it's a free item. So, Absolutely. Uh, Deviation of focus is critical because, you know, suddenly everybody on the team is is chasing a different thing. You're not going to achieve anything if everybody's running different directions. Any success stories that you've had that, that's been like when you started when you started going into Penn, you started working on your own, working on your own business. What was the thing that hit that was like, all right, we got this like this is our like this is we can do this now. Right. right. Well, it was interesting when we started Palisade, because Palisade is really, you know, in terms of going independent, that's probably my favorite success story, partially because okay. it's so recent, but partially because, you know, it, it was a real and still is a real success the company still out there. You have any Oracle issues, they're the people to talk to. But so we, we started this company. And for the first six months, we're trying to get traction because the company we started was going to teach people how to negotiate better deals with Oracle former Oracle VP, co-founder, former Oracle VP. We ran that stuff for Oracle. What was funny was for both Craig, my co-founder, and me, there was a tiny part of our responsibilities when we were at Oracle around license audit mm -hmm. about, you know, the, the process that Oracle goes through to say, we think you're stealing software, prove us wrong. You know, that's that's their, their business model for audit. Yeah. And so we were trying to, to start a business based on the 95% of our time at Oracle, which was negotiating deals. And our first five clients, four of them were being audited by Oracle. That was the bleeding problem. And so mm -hmm. suddenly we pivoted in like month five of the business and we were no longer just about negotiating with Oracle. Suddenly we're hiring people who used to work for us who do software license audits and have the technology around you know how to go into Oracle license estates and find the software and see the interrelation of the different products. And so for me, you know, pivoting that fast and realizing the market tells you what business you're in was, was a big step because people with a big company background usually aren't that nimble. They, mm -hmm. they tend to struggle with making those, those quick jumps. And so you know, I think the, the other thing that, that I feel like was a real early success for us was our first customers were big enough that they funded the build out of the business. So we weren't really looking for angel investors or that sort of thing. And, and you know, at the time, BlackBerry was still a thing. And they, they, they were one of our first clients. And they really kind of funded us being able to make the pivot, hire the right people, and, and get into that audit business in a very big way. And so I think that was, again, a, a series of just sort of being able to spot that, that we needed to, to change our approach and then dynamically adapt to it. That I feel like was just, when I look back, that's, that's one of those successes I'm the most proud of. Awesome. The, uh, the one point that you talked about the funding, that was going to be my next question. So you beat me to it because that, because that's a big question everyone has, right? When they're starting a business or when they're trying to go freelance, because like in my background, I was, I was working at a startup and then I went freelance in order to be able to start my own business, right? To start Grata Software, which is my company. And then after I developed enough business, I went, you know, full on to Grata Software. And I, I talk about in my story how I went cold turkey and just kind of like jumped over, which I did. I kind of did it. I didn't have, I had a lot of sales, but I didn't have a lot of money in the account. So in, in your case, and you said you were funded by a client to start off with. Well, right. We, 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 we made our first big sale. And the money mm -hmm. from that sale was what kind of funded the, the the build out of the company. Now, did you do that while you were you guys were still working, or was it something that 
No, we, right at that point. We, we had already gone out on our own. We're about five months into being on our own. And then through an executive that both of us knew when we were at Oracle, they made the introduction to, to okay. this, this customer of Oracle's who was struggling with it. Yeah. And so it was very much a case of, you know, get out there, kind of put the shingle out, let people see that you're doing something. And that creates the opportunity for things to happen. But I think the, the key, though, is, you know, whatever you're bootstrapping, you know, bootstrapping makes a lot of sense for a low capital intensive business. You know, we, we didn't really need to find money to to lease a facility or to to do all of the various things. So what we were able to do and, and you know, COVID has taught a lot of people how to do this was create a 100% virtual company in 2013, which really wasn't normal back then. You're right. And, yeah. and, you know, hire people wherever they were. I mean, you know, our first, my co-founder was in New Jersey. I was in Florida. Our first hire was in Boston. So we started kind of cherry picking people from all over the country, you know, Texas, Idaho, you know, just all of these different places. And so I, I think that was, you know, when, when we were kind of launching the business, it was okay. Just kind of keep it within the realm of the the inbound money. The only challenge with that is, anytime you you sort of start a business and you don't raise any money, you can miss opportunities because you're being really very cautious, very conservative. Yes. You don't have the ability to really push out there and and be very bold and make big decisions to kind of spark start the business up. You kind of have to be more almost too cautious. I think sometimes. And, I think that that can teach you lessons that later in the business, you're still too cautious. And so, yeah. Yeah, being cautious is very important because some people, when they go into business for themselves, they'll see this big, shiny contract. And then when they read the fine line, some of them don't read it and they'll do, they'll agree to it. But then the fine line says you have to meet your first milestone before you actually get paid on it. And if you don't have the cash flow and you don't have the ability to do that, you sign into a contract where you're now responsible for kind of paying up front on that contract. And well, that'll and, put and you even, under just as quick. And even then talking about our Dell background, you know, Dell pioneered the notion of you'll sell me this stuff today and I'll pay you sometime next quarter. You know, yes. so so that that was that it was and probably still is a big chunk of their business model, especially when people get that first big contract from, you know, a General Motors or a Lockheed or something like that. Then you find out it's net 105 days after they'll admit that you delivered. So you mm-hmm. get into that argument about delivery. They finally say, fine, sure, you delivered. And then that starts a 105 day clock. And that can kill a small business, you know, who's, who's really counting on that money to, to make payroll. Yeah, at Dell, I remember the cage. Uh, they had the cage where all the all the equipment and everything got shipped to the whatever got shipped to the cage meant it's still not Dell's. They don't own it yet until yeah. it gets out of the cage. So therefore, the company already delivered, and it's sitting in this cage for like you said, could be 150 days, however many days, and Dell doesn't pay for it because right. they're just housing it in this cage that says we don't own this yet until it passes that gate. It has so. to. It has to go across it. In in Round Rock, there was a yellow line on the floor. And if it passed over that yellow line, it became Dell's property only until you could slap it into a computer and get it out the door. Exactly. So that was that was the beauty of that model. They held on to to inventory, if you will, just for seconds. You know, so. Yeah. So let's talk about a little bit the, the at the beginning, the technology, because you said 2013, you guys are remote. Right. So tell me how how you were able to do remote back things. I think Zoom didn't exist yet. A lot of these a lot of these new tools that we use today in order to maintain a remote workforce, they didn't exist back then. So what did you guys do to to maintain the culture camaraderie and then also the teamwork on that? I think the benefit we had was Oracle was a very virtual company at the time. You know, you would have big offices with 40, 50, 60 people in it. But, you know, case in point, I was running Europe from Texas. And so because you know, my, my work visa hadn't quite gotten sorted out. So, so you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with these vast organizations that you would only see everybody in very occasionally. So we had that culture kind of coming over from the company that all of us had worked for. So we use tools like Skype and, and some of the other things. I think one of the things that I've seen change, particularly over the last few years, is, yes, there are all these tools out there and they're very powerful. And, you know, we, we, we used Basecamp. We used Smartsheet. We used you know, all of these tools to try and keep track of what was going on, that sort of thing. 
But what's really emerged over the last few years is data security has become more and more of a, a, a real uh, concern. And especially if you're going to deal with mid-sized to large companies, you know, that they have very strict policies and they're watching. So those people who kind of sign a contract and get going, you know, suddenly the next thing they get is a contact from one of our clients at Palisade, giant insurance company. And mm -hmm. I spent more time working with the seven people from their technology team who were concerned about, I, I spent three days talking to one lady about disabling USB ports, mm -hmm. you know, so, so that's really emerged. And I think a lot of us have seen post COVID companies had to get very good at being flexible about where people worked. And it was a real plus for Palisade because before COVID, we would have clients not work with us because we weren't willing to do the big five consulting firm thing and have a team go on site for two weeks. Yeah. We would want to work entirely virtual. You know, here are our data collection scripts. You'll run them. You'll send us the output. We'll then analyze it. After COVID, those companies were like, okay, yes, we can allow that. That's fine. No problem at all. But here are all the security requirements. So I think yeah. that's, that's the biggest thing I see evolving now. Whereas companies in the past could use even things like Teams, even things you know like like OneDrive or Box or that sort of thing. Every single customer has a different approach to those things, and so we have to kind of deal with each of them. And that's the biggest thing I've seen evolve over the last ten years since we started it. We were able to be incredibly creative very early on because nobody was really sure what all that meant yet. But as as things have matured then a lot of the oversight has really come down. And you know, you can be a two-person company, and if you're going to try to sell to these giants, you have to have an answer for that. And that's, yeah. that's, I think, been a real challenge. What I find interesting is how when you work with each of those companies, they, they contradict each other. And what's the right security protocol? So we have a project we work with Apple on. When we mentioned that we were going to run all email notifications to Amazon Web Services, they threw a fit. And we're sure. like, our data does not pass through Amazon at all. Like, you, and so they wouldn't let us use it. But like when you talk about Drive, like some companies will use Drive. Some companies say Drive is not secure enough. So they want you to use Dropbox. And then you have another company say Dropbox is not secure enough. So, right. want, so, so it's a constant back and forth. The one thing that we all can agree on is if you have, if you're an enterprise, everyone has Office 365. Right. And everybody has the SSO, the Microsoft, you know, single sign-on across all their platforms and, and they use all of the internal Microsoft stuff. So a lot of these large enterprise companies, that's what they do. And that, that's how they, that's like the least common denominator when it comes to security for enterprise. Everyone kind of just lays over to Microsoft's Office 365 platform. Well, absolutely. And I think that the funny thing for me is there are, and, and I, I, for my, the first 12 years of my career, I worked in procurement. So I've always had a real, then I, then I went over to the dark side and ever since then I've been in sales. Yeah. And so the, the thing that I've seen over and over again is these little companies go into these giant companies and they convince like a big auto company that here's our security platform. You, the big auto company, don't have to pay a penny. All of your vendors have to pay five, six, seven thousand dollars a piece to be certified by our platform. But then the pitch is you'll never have to go through all of that security stuff again because you've already gotten you know certified by us. Well, that's great. But exactly to your point, while that big car company likes it, big car company across the street has never heard of that platform. So they don't care. And yeah. so very early on, you know, we were looking at some of those early platforms and we would say, OK, great. You know, you've been introduced to us by this giant company and we have to work with you to work with them. Who else do you work with? And nine times out of 10, what we would find is it's like a half a dozen companies. That was really it, you know? Yeah. And so I think that, that yeah, that's maddening. But honestly, it's, it's part of the cost of doing business. And I think that burns out a lot of very technically minded people or a lot of very creative people because suddenly you're not in the business creating solutions. You're satisfying bureaucrats. And I think yeah. that's, a, that's a, just a huge roadblock for a lot of people. They hit that and suddenly it's not fun anymore. Absolutely. A friend of mine works at one of the top big box consulting companies right. that is actually in uh, Lake Mary. So, you, <laughs> so you'll know exactly <laughs> what, which one that is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so he, he says that when they do, when they make recommendations, technical recommendations, to these large Fortune 500 companies, he says a lot of times it's, it's a PowerPoint presentation on a theory of what could work, but they mm -hmm. don't actually implement it or even have a test case or a prototype or a proof of concept. It's just basically, this is what we think is going to work. 
And then they char- they basically do the PowerPoint presentation and charge $250,000 and they sign the check. No problem. And it's because most of, they're just trying to satisfy the bureaucrats. They're trying to satisfy the we met the requirement of looking into this, but we don't really care about doing this. Like, we just need to spend our budget on something. We've, we've done our due diligence. And you know, exactly. the, the, the thing that I talk about to a lot of the companies that I mentor is, look, you know, at the end of the day, there's a business person somewhere in that company who needs your solution. And if you can get them to cooperate with you to, to kind of come at their bureaucracy from the inside, that's the way you'll get through it. So the thing I always used to say about security or about a lot of the other stuff is find the grown up. There's almost always a grown up somewhere in security who, or IT security in these big companies that can look at your, your solution and say, yeah, you know, there's no real risk here. That's fine. We can, we can do this. We can do that. The challenge, though, can be when you've got your sponsor on the inside. If you're asking that sponsor to sign up and say, yeah, we don't need to worry about human trafficking or, yeah, we don't need to worry about you know, these, these things. Very few people are going to put their career on the line around something like that. But at the very least, your customer on the inside of the big company can tell you where, where you're not going to be able to come to a, a grown up agreement. You know, there's just no flexibility there. And as a lot of this stuff moves to AI, you know, the flexibility you know, it used to be a few years ago, you'd be talking to a person who was a badged employee of that company. Then a few years later, you were talking to a person still a badged employee, but offshore. And then mm-hmm. you're talking to a company offshore that's contracted under the, the, the customer, your customer. And yeah. today, increasingly, you're going to be talking to an AI. And the AI is going to say, I'm sorry, you know, uh, this, this European regulation, I know you're in Arkansas, but the European regulation applies. And you're like, well, I don't do, do business in Europe. Yes, well, the yeah. European regulation replies. And it's, it's, you know, it's just going to be, I can't wait till I have my AI who can talk to them and they can just kind of go into that circle. And then I don't have to have anything to do with it until both AIs throw up at their hands and bump it up to a human. So, you know, it's interesting because the, the uh, I was telling you last night, I was editing a, the previous podcast that, that I had recorded. And th- there's a whole moment in there. We talk for about a good 10 minutes on the the humanity side or the inhumane side of AI, mm-hmm. where we're talking about like what you're just saying right there. At some point, we'll be talking to AI as the de facto standard. Like that's the agent that we're talking to that's giving us the information that we need to move forward with, whether it be a project or, or you know, some type of negotiation or even just initial contact with other companies that to meet certain requirements. So what, what is your take what it, on, on artificial intelligence right now? What is what? It, give me your hot take on it right now. So I use it a lot for a bunch of different purposes. The interesting thing to me is, in fact, I just had this conversation with a law firm that, that is a client of mine. And they have been feeling very smug that AI will never replace us because, you know, the, the current state of AI is, is terrible. And, you know, I look at what they're doing. There's two real dimensions here for me. It's one, I look at big companies and I used to be the person who flew around offshoring things. I did it at Dell. I did it at a bunch of other places. And people would say, oh, there's no way anybody could ever figure out how to do our jobs. It's so complicated. And I would say, well, I've looked at a hundred of the last times that you did that thing, and you did it exactly the same way each time. There was no variability. You did it exactly the same way. And they said, well, right. I said, okay. And then we expand to the last 500 times. Twice there was a boundary condition. So, you know, that sort of thing is easy. That's going to be very easy to push out. And so we did a lot of that thinking when we were doing business process redesign and then, you know, outsourcing and then offshoring. So making the jump to AI for those types of things is is simple. You know, there's going to be a lot of work around getting it set up and getting it running. But right now, there's a, a weird trust in the magic box that AI lives inside because it's so non-transparent. I, I, I can't tell how ChatGPT is giving me this advice, but the advice is really good. I love the way it summarized that. I love the way it did this. I love the way it did this, but I don't know how. And I think that's that's the biggest challenge. We're, we're kind of being asked to trust the magic box that all of that. And stuff by the is way, made. open AI even says they don't know. Sure. Yeah. You know, say they don't know why it, it why they're getting the results they're getting. They, yeah. they say the same thing. 
which and you know as somebody who who kind of listened to a lot of fairy tales growing up about sort of the evil wizard of the magic box that's a little concerning but hey you know there's another expression from the military if it's crazy but it works it's not crazy anymore suddenly it's it's yeah. how you do that you know so i but i think that that what i'm seeing really a lot of with ai right now is we have made up a lot of rules and a lot of process and a lot of things that that should be done a certain way. But almost universally, people kind of wink and nod and kind of slide through and get business transacted or or get deliverables done or, or you know, there's a layer of common sense that that kind of kind of trowels over everything. But then AI comes in and suddenly it's behaving as if all the stuff we've ever written down in these big organizations is true. And and it's making decisions as if we actually do dot every I and cross every T and make sure this is done and that is done. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges that I'm seeing because there are a couple of large companies that I've, I've, I've talked to in the past about how they negotiate deals. And they've bought software in the past that claimed to have AI embedded in it. But it was almost always a train wreck because there was no, there was no judgment associated with it. And so I think the the thing that I told this law firm, though, was AI gets better at an incredible rate of speed. And so, yeah, today, I I probably am not 100% on self-driving cars and that sort of thing. But five years from now, when probably, you know, self-driving cars are going to be so much better than they are today, that's a lot faster than we've ever seen before when we would outsource or offshore something. You know, we push something offshore within a year. They were about 60 to 70 percent as good at doing that as the person here in the U.S. I'm talking for like like legal marketing kind of yeah. higher end stuff. And you would spend about another three years getting to the point where they were about 75 percent as good as the people on site used to be. AI is making that jump in months instead of years. And I think that's the thing that for me, my hot take is, yeah, I use it for a lot of you know content generation and that kind of stuff today. I ask it to summarize things. You know, I used to get paid a lot of money to summarize things for people. And, you know, AI does it really fast. And so that's cool. You know, the the thing you're going to find is a lot of people are like, whoa, 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 that's taking my job, you know, and I'm going to fight it. And the thing I've been saying my entire career is, look, I can choose whether I'm going to fight this or I'm going to figure out how to use it. Yeah. I think if you've ever, you ever heard that expression, if you can't beat them, join them. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> That's exactly what we're in right now. <laughs> I, I have joined them my entire career. You, know, you tell me what the latest thing is. I'm right there with you. <laughs> so you know, it's funny because we uh, we you, the what you just said right there about how you know you could fight it or you could just join along with it, and so uh, we've never fought it. In fact, when when OpenAI came out with ChatGPT, I went into the office. And all my employees were sitting there and I said, everyone log in, figure out what this thing can do, how it's going to shorten our timelines for delivery. Like this is a tool. I'm like, don't make it the de facto everything like, but at least use it to help you augment what you're doing and be more efficient. And I think we've done a phenomenal job at it. The, uh, in fact, I used it a few days ago. I, and I'm, you know, I normally, I haven't coded as much as I used to years ago um, because I'm more like running the company at this point. And, and we had, I had a call from a client that we had probably about six, seven years ago, and they wanted to prototype an idea. Mm-hmm. And they called me up and told me, told me what the idea was. And I just went inside chat GBT and I gave it all the descriptions as if I was talking to one of my developers and giving them like the real requirements, very similar to what I would do if I go into our JIRA and I give them the requirements. And I was so detailed. I gave it everything. And then when it and then when it produced an output, I was able to see the output and then understand it because I have the years of experience in software engineering. And I was able to convert my next prompt to be like, OK, this is what you did here. This is what you did there. This is what I need you to do. And also so in less than an hour, I built the prototype and I wow. put and then the funny thing is normally you would have to launch it on a server. And originally the AI had built it in a technology called Flask, which is a Python based backend. And in order to deploy that, you have to build out a server. You have to do all of this work. So I said, just make it a single page JavaScript application. And then it converted to a single page Java application. And I used GitHub because they have this thing called GitHub pages where you could just launch all your code up there. And then just if you activate the page, you basically are getting your application served, you know, for free, essentially part of the thing. So I just did that and I sent the link to my client. And yesterday he sent me a message. He's like, yeah, every meeting I'm using this now. 
because yeah. I just go to the, the site and I just use it. And it was it took me an hour and a half tops to do the whole thing. And it was just a prototype. But, you know, it's it's not enterprise. It's not going to be able to be used by thousands of people. But for what he needed at that moment, just to demonstrate, I was able to knock it out in an hour and a half tops. I, I think that that's the key. You're using it as a tool, but you're using it as a tool based on you know a solid, solid, solid base of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. that's that's the thing I'm seeing on, on the legal side, because a lot of my, my experience has been with negotiating deals and, and that sort of thing. And what people are trying to do is, I don't know anything about the law. I'm going to throw this contract into ChatGPT and tell me what I need to worry about. Well, you know, (laughs) so ChatGPT comes back with something. It will. But you don't know. There's not that base of knowledge. And so, so what I'll do a lot of times is I'll go through, I'll do the contract review. And then I'll throw it into a tool like ChatGPT or one of the other ones just to see, hey, did I miss anything? You know, because I've already done my review. This is, you know, in so many of our knowledge jobs, we don't have any real quality check. You know, so having that kind of working in tandem with us, that's how I'm kind of using it as a tool. But I think, you know, so often right now we see it with a lot of of big companies where, look, we're going to get rid of this this hundred person team who used to do that. And we're now going to have AI doing it. But AI really isn't flexible the way that 100-person team used to be. And yeah. so I think that's that's one of the biggest dangers right now that I see that in this sort of endless quest for cost savings and increased margins, then I think we adopt a technology based on what we want it to be rather than what it actually is. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the thing about, and when you said it right there, it's again, we go back to the whole knowledge thing. Like, unless you are an expert in that field, it's you, you need to be an expert in the field to understand what the response is and and be able to validate whether if it's giving you the correct response or not. Um, it's like that law firm, and I'm sure you've heard, heard the story, uh, that lawyer that basically took a chat GPT case, like cases right. into the into the court and they were and they cited all these cases and the judge is like, I've never these cases don't even exist. And it was because the artificial intelligence just made up cases. Hallucinated them. Yeah. Yeah, it hallucinated yeah. that that met their requirement of what they were trying to prove. And uh, and I, I don't know if that lawyer got disbarred, but that definitely would be an occasion to be disbarred. You know, yeah. well, you certainly wouldn't want to go back in front of that judge for anything else. That, that's exactly. The, well, I think exactly. that, that, you know, the the life has become so complex in a lot of areas that I think, you know, we, we want the we want the easy button. We want the, the quick you know outcome. And so I think that that for me, I really believe that that soon you're going to have a team in a big company and you're going to have people who work for you. You're going to have you know contractors who work for you and you're going to have you know AI tools that work for you. And it yeah. is going to be kind of a mix of all of that. And so the the challenge, I think, is really going to be justifying keeping the first two when AI looks like it can do everything. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's go back to, let's take you back to the business side of, sure. for a little bit. Yeah. So you, I, I wanted to get to this part because I think it's super important for people that are watching and listening to understand because you worked, you had your own company, but you also exited that company. And I think a lot of people like to know how did that exit work? Like what led to it? Was it because you wanted to go out and do something else? I know you mentioned a little bit about this, but if you could elaborate more on that, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Happy to. So, um, you know, when we started Palisade, a large part of it is based on the credibility of the founders. You know, the the, the very early days, the fact that Craig, my co-founder, was a global VP, I was VP for Europe, that opened a lot of doors. And so it was it was really essential. And then we started to grow the company. And, you know, I took more and more control of operations and making sure that our service quality was good and all that sort of thing. And, and, and Craig and would do more of the sales and that sort of thing. And then over time, our roles kind of blurred. Well, you know, there is an expression for me from Texas, where I spent a lot of time, that, you know, don't wrestle with a pig because the you get dirty and the pig enjoys it. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you, after 10 years of fighting Oracle software license audit cases, wow. You know, I, that, that was a lot longer than I ever expected to continue to be doing the 5% of the job I had at Oracle. You know, that, mm-hmm. that, was, that was a big. So for me, I approached my co-founder. Really, he and I had had a conversation before COVID. But, you know, when COVID happened, let's keep the team together. Let's not make any big changes, that sort of thing. 
But, you know, there was a really good transparency of communication between the founders. And I think if you're thinking about an exit, you know, I'm not going to say be transparent with your VC because, you know, your VC will say thank you for that transparency. And then, you know, you don't get to control the narrative after that. Yeah. You have to make decisions for yourself. In, in my case, you know, we, we were the only people we needed to talk to. So I made a very clear case for, look, I still have a stake. I'm still supporting the company. In fact, anybody, any of your viewers wants to talk about Oracle software licensing, drop me a line. I'm happy to, to introduce you to some people. But I really wanted to kind of go down a different road, especially once I started doing this sort of founder mentoring through UCF. I've been doing that as a volunteer, and it's become kind of a of, of, a business kind of outside of that. It's, it's become my next thing that I'm doing. And so I think one of the biggest challenges is letting go. And uh, it was funny, I was watching this Gary V presentation. He was talking to a bunch of event planners at an event planner conference. They paid him to come in and, and do his talk. And he said, how many of you here own your business? Everybody in the room raises their hand. Okay. How many of you here have a partner in the business that you can trust running the business when you're not there? And most of them put their hands down. And Gary Vee said, leave my talk, go out into the hall and hire that person. So, you know, the, the way I was able to do it was, you know, I'd always been that person for Craig. Craig had always been that person for me. I built up a management team under me of people who could take over and run things. And I really believe when an executive leaves, then, you know, it usually takes, if it's a good executive, it takes a few weeks to even notice they're gone because they've built systems and there's quality people who make sure things keep going. What happens when an executive leaves, and especially when a founder leaves, is you're not changing things as much. Because the biggest part of my job for especially the last few years has been, what are we changing? What are we, what are we doing to evolve and adapt? Mm -hmm. And so that was the hardest thing I had to teach the people who were going to take over for me is... Here's how to think around corners and, and make the changes. So, you know, we always think that when we're going to exit a business, either the business is gone, you know, because a lot of businesses fail. I've had my share of those. Or it's gotten bought and now we're a billionaire. But I think I would say the vast majority of exits are somewhat similar to what I've done. It's like, look, I've gotten to a certain point. I want to do something else. I've made a good deal that's good for my business, but also good for me. And it's very amicable. Everybody's everybody's friendly. Everybody's happy. Craig and I still talk. And I think what you'll find is a lot of times you're much better friends with your, your colleagues and co-founders after you've exited than, than you were day to day while you were there. So Yeah, that makes sense because the amount of pressure when you are there, you guys are probably on each other's necks the whole time. Yeah. You know, well, and, and, and honestly, I think the, the, the fun thing for me since I exited is... I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But one of the things you have to do when you're a founder in your business or when you're a C-level executive is you really owe it to the people who work for your business to be 100% focused there. You don't focus anywhere else. You're not thinking about, oh, I think I'm going to go get a job doing this or I'm going to run an ice cream truck or you know anything like that. The day after you leave is really the first day you can start thinking like that because the business requires your 100% focus. While you're there, you, you, know, you don't just owe it to yourself. You owe it to the people who kind of took a, a chance leaving their giant company to come work for you. Yeah. And so I think that's that's the biggest thing for me as I looked at exiting is how can I do it in such a way that our clients are completely cool with the fact that, OK, Sopko's not there, but he's still you know available to the business. And, hey, I, I haven't dealt with Sopco in months. I've dealt with this person. I've dealt with this person. And, you know, the, the transition has been made. In big companies, we don't think about transitions. We just push a button. That team's gone. This team is your new interface. But in smaller companies and startups, you really have to overthink that part. Of it. Yeah. No, it makes sense. The quick story, when I wait, uh, years ago, when I decided I was going to step away from the forefront of, like, doing the engineering and talking to the customers and all that stuff, I hired a bunch of people, hired about 10 employees, and I started creating that separation so that, you know, the system's in place. And right. and then one of my biggest clients called me up and he says, Ray, he goes, we hired you for you. Mm. So we didn't hire you for, the, you know, for the other people. And right. it, it made me really think how I was presenting the company as a whole and presenting myself when I would talk to customers. I would sell myself so much right. in the process as the company, like it was attached. And so the, when it came time to separate Customers had tr trouble with the separation because okay. they were they they loved the fact that they could talk to me directly. They knew that I was very knowledgeable in the skill 
that they needed. And so whenever they ran into a snag or anything, they would contact me, even though I had a whole team of people that were smarter than me that I hired, that I would actually go to them. I'd turn around and be like, hey, so-and-so is having this problem. Do you guys know how we can resolve this? And my team would come up with the answer, but my client would always, because you know, they were so used to me being that guy, they just could not detach from that situation. So, um, Well, and we've been so sensitized to bait and switch. I think so many of us have been kind of, you know, we, we are dealing with somebody, we decide to work with them, and all those cool people that we worked with during the sales process are gone three weeks after the engagement starts. Yeah. And, and suddenly it's a whole new group of people. And so I think that was, that was one of the things we started doing at Palisade this eight years ago. We realized that we had a big drop-off between the sales process and the start of the delivery process. And what that drop-off creates is buyer's remorse. Yeah. You know, the, the client that, that really went out on a limb to come to you, there's a, if there's a drop between the end of sales and the beginning of the value, you know, you've got to eliminate that drop off. And I, I think that's the, the biggest thing. I think one of the things I'm really proud about at Palisade is, and I started joking about this, and I've actually told Fortune, 5, Fortune 100 CIOs, yeah, you don't get to talk to somebody who knows something until you've gone with us. You know, you're going to talk to me until then. And, you know, I'm yeah. going to tell you high level strategic things, but, you know, I'm going to introduce you to the person who's going to save you. And over 90 percent of the time, my clients valued the relationship with the person that was running their team, not with me. I like that. That that to me says that I've, I've, I've again, I've made that bridge. And, you know, yeah. I think the other thing is there are layers here. Most of the people who sign the checks aren't really technically minded. Exactly. <laughs> they, they I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah, they want to work with a person. The, the quality or elegance of the solution is important, they, yeah. but they assume that. But what they know how to value is the interpersonal relationship. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I, I totally get it. The, uh, every time, every time I, I get a new project or whatever, you know, I'm, t I'm talking, I'm on the sales side. And, I, and a lot of times when I'm talking to the people that write the checks, right. they're completely just like, I'm over their head. They just don't understand. And then what happens is they, when I finally talk to the engineers of the company, they become our champions and go back and say, yeah, these are the guys we need to hire. Right. And so a lot of times we'll interface with them. And then they're the ones that are going back and getting us our checks. So we're not interfacing with any of the business people, only the engineers. <laughs> right. You know, and it's funny because so naturally living on the Space Coast, my immediate neighbors are all super smart engineers. And so we had the neighbors over when we first moved into the house. And this couple comes over. They both work at NASA. And the, the, uh, the, the, the wife, she says, OK, well, I work on this team and we do that. I jump in. I'm like, oh, is that the lunar probe that's going to use a laser and vaporize rock? And she's like, yeah. And then the husband's like, well, I work on this axle design, this, that, and the other. And I go total fanboy. I'm like, oh, is that the thing that's going to do this, that, and the other? And my wife kind of looks over and realizes they're both completely freaked out. And she says, so, you know, is that, a, is that okay? And they're like, yeah, we're just not used to people really knowing what we do. You know, yeah. it's just a little, little worrisome that, that there's, there's this fanboy kind of idea. And so the worst thing I think you probably run into is when you've got an executive who has this much knowledge, not all of it, and we exactly. totally fanboy. We're like, oh, yeah, 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 I love that. I read about that in a magazine. I started playing with it. Now I do, I do this, that, and the other. And then suddenly you're trying to... That's great. I love that you know that. Yeah. Here's what you don't know. And that could be a real barrier, I imagine. Well, it's one of the reasons why we, years ago, we decided to work specifically with small business owners who are like owner operators mm -hmm. because they, because they're the, they're the ones that are fanboyish of their, right. what they're doing. And then, so we're fanboying and then we're, you know, we're in it together. For instance, like the, uh, the other company I told you, there's a satellite company that we're going to be working with. Like the CEO of that satellite company is the engineer. Yeah. He's the guy that knows all of it. So we immediately hit it off the moment we started talking because because I have a member of my team who used to work in the in space projects and government contracts. And so when we had our first meeting with their engineers and everything, I mean, we were just it was just like one big conference call of just a bunch of engineer fanboys just talking about what we're going to do. Has, and everyone just like lit up like we were right. we're actually so excited to work with each other because like we're all going to be in this like mentally physically and everything. So, so it does go along to your point really quick. So once you went back, once you decided to exit, I want you to talk about what you're doing today and then what's your goal? What are you, what are you trying to do with your new uh, venture? I appreciate that. Thank you. So, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I took a number of months to figure out what I wanted to do because, you know, over 10 years, I came up with a lot of ideas I wanted to pursue and play with and that sort of thing. 
So the thing that, that I've really landed on, and I call it actually ChatGPT helped me figure this out. I call it being a growth advisor and an on-demand executive. And so the so case in point, one of my clients, I'm basically their EVP for partner management because they're trying to establish partnerships with Booz Allen Hamilton and Lockheed Martin and, and companies like that. Really so quick, I'm kind of EVP. Could you describe EVP? Real quick? Uh, uh, executive vice president. So okay. you know, I'm kind of <laughs> filling in that spot. For a couple of reasons. One, once you've established the alliances, you really don't need a senior level executive to establish the alliances. They're established and now you can put it into the, the framework of what you're doing. So sometimes, you know, I have clients who have a short term need for a very high level thing. And so I do that. I'm doing a lot of work where I'm mentoring small businesses. There's this one, uh, it's a math app that this, this 13 year old girl in the UK coded. And her dad reached out to me. He's a former competitor of mine. And, you know, he, he and I have these, these long conversations about how do you market it? What's your unique selling proposition? How do you make the next step? So, you know, I do a lot of that. So, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to the UCF Business Incubator because I started working with them as a volunteer. And that kind of lit me up. And I realized that helping people solve these problems, you know, if I've got some clients who aren't growing fast enough, I help them grow faster, sales, marketing, all that kind of stuff. I've got some clients who are growing too fast and now they've got to kind of rein it back in. So I help with, uh, I was a COO, I do a lot of process stuff, that sort of thing. So being able to work both sides of that equation has been, has been just a lot of fun. And so I think the thing I'm, I'm trying to do right now is I'm, I'm really wanting to make a go of this as a consultant. I've been a consultant on and off through my entire career. And I think right now what people really want is not, I don't want to hire somebody who six months from now is not going to be delivering value because they came in and solved all the problems I hired them to solve. So yeah. that's the kind of role I really like, and it's what I'd like to do. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm partnering up with, uh, I've got a very good friend who was a chief human capital officer at a couple of very big tech companies. She and I are going to work together on a couple of projects. So I think that's the thing right now. So, and it's weird because I'm really struggling with putting a convenient label on it, but uh, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. Cause when we moved more to consulting on our business, it's, the hardest part is how do you how do you how do you explain what you do? Yeah, you know, to some people, how do you explain the because you know the value we talk about? We always talk about the value proposition, sure. and the hard part is with consultants, it's an intangible, so they're not physically touching something yet. It's going to come in the future, like the results will come. You know, it's getting past that initial hurdle of I don't have something tangible that I'm going to get for the money that I'm I'm paying out. I think that's the biggest thing. And, and, you know, with the evolution of coaching, because back in 2019, I went and became a certified coach because, you know, I do a lot of mentoring and that's coaching has really started to kind of evolve where people say coaching solves all problems. But I feel like since I am a coach and I am a consultant, the difference between the two is a coach is going to help you figure out your answer. The consultant's going to implement that answer for you. And, and you know, that they will do a lot of the heavy lifting to get you across the line. So yeah. for my clients, it's like, you know, do you want to talk about it and come up with your own solution and then decide what you want to do to implement it? Or do you pretty much know what you want and you need somebody who's going to come in and build it for you, make it work? And I think Absolutely. so. I think that's that's the key. It's helping people figure out what they want and then, you know, staying with them until they have it. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why you see a lot of this distinction between consulting and coaching out there. In fact, we on our website even talk about the same thing. We talk about we have a consulting service, we have a coaching service. And people do ask that question, what's the difference? And like you said, a coach is kind of there, like kind of guiding you through it, but they're not physically going to put their hands on it. You know, right. They're just guiding you through the process. We're a consultant, we're, we're doing the lifting. We're, we're, it's like a done with you service. So. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for the people who trained me how to be a coach because my wife and I both went through the programs with a, a company called IPEC at the same time. And I think they kind of despaired about me because I would be so, you know what you ought to do. And I'd start telling them, you know, telling the people I was coaching what they ought to do. Yeah. The minute somebody tells you what you ought to do, they're no longer a coach. They're a mentor. They're a consultant. These are valuable things, but it's no longer yeah. coaching. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't like to say that I nearly flunked out, but, you know, they, they had a lot of teaching to do to kind of help me use the tools correctly. So listen, so we're, we were definitely over time, but this has been a great conversation. I do want to get these last couple questions. That, well, first of all, what would you, what would you recommend for someone who's wanting to become an entrepreneur, wanting to go on their own, build their own business? Like, what would you say to them as advice and also, if you want to throw in there from a technical perspective, 
what things to look for to help them in their journey? The biggest thing I would say is if you're a technical minded person and you build things and you're an engineer and, and you want to start a business, what it takes to be a good engineer or a good lawyer or a good accountant or a good massage therapist is completely alien to what it takes to be a good business person. Uh, Bessemer, and people can look this up, uh, Bessemer, the venture capital firm, did this very cool thing four months ago where they wrote a paper about the difference between a founder and an entrepreneur. And a founder is the person who has the vision, has the idea, builds the prototype process, you know, project, a lot of times gets it to you know, MVP, the minimal viable product. But they need to bring in a business person, you know, who's who's as skilled as they are at the thing they're passionate about. This person's skilled at the business side. And we've seen so many of those partnerships that end in tears because either the business person comes in, you know, deceives the, the visionary founder and suddenly the business person runs away with the business. I mean, that's what everybody's scared about. So what we all try to do is go and do a Google search about, you know, how to figure out if I need to have an LLC. And we just kind of try to do it all ourselves. And I'm from a generation that, that you know, Gen X, we try to do everything ourselves. If I never had to talk to a person about anything, that that's like the Gen X dream come true, right? So I think the, the biggest advice I would have to somebody who's starting their own business is it's incredibly intimidating. The regulations, the rules have gotten a lot more onerous over the last few years, but still do it. You know, go and figure out what problem am I solving? And then am I going to solve that problem through a business or am I going to solve that problem because I have a piece of the much larger solution? That's a lot of what I'm doing right now with clients. I've got a couple clients who went through all of the effort to start a business, get an LLC, get set up to take money, get credit card processing set up. And I had to tell one the other day, you don't have a whole solution. You have a very valuable piece of somebody else's big solution. So what you have to do is go figure out at that point, who are my alliance partners? Who do I sell through? What's my, what, what ecosystem am I in? So I think really kind of thinking all that through becomes very important. And then the other thing I'll say is the business you do a year later will look nothing like the business you do on day one. It's, it never has for me. And I've, been, I've run technical businesses, I've run you know, advisory businesses, and it always comes down to the same thing. So if you fall too in love with the idea that you're not willing to pivot, that's where I see a lot of businesses fail. Some great nuggets right there. I'm telling you, I, I, I second that. Every single thing you just said, I second it. Cool. So, so Stephen, tell the audience, how should they find you? Where should they look? Sure. Well, the easiest way to find me is on LinkedIn. Uh, the advantage of having a unique last name like Sopco is I'm pretty easy to find. And we'll throw a link down in the, 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 the comments on this. But, but I think that's probably the easiest way to do it. I do have a website for my coaching business. But like I say, just reach out through LinkedIn. And I think that's probably the best way. Awesome. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for being on this podcast. I, it was, I really wanted to dig further, but I think we'll be here for like three hours if I do. Hey, <laughs> let, let's get back together and, and see what, what, what the reaction to this is. And we'll, we'll go, you know, we'll go whatever direction we go, but thank you absolutely. for having me. It's, it's always terrific to talk to you. So, so thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And for those listening, watching, definitely check out the podcast, like subscribe, do all the things that you would do to follow the podcast. And again, reach out to Stephen. We're going to have all of his information in the description and in the show notes. So just reach out and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next podcast. Thank you. And again, thanks, Stephen, for joining the podcast. My pleasure.